that brings me to introduce our speaker, who is Professor Manoj Mate of UC Irvine, who specializes, who teaches and specializes both constitutional law and international and comparative law. And he says his, uh, you know, his current research, uh, I don't understand a word of this. <laughs> I mean, how international trade law impacts development policy space. How, I'm sure somebody understands it. But what struck my eye is he also is researching comparative election law and democratic governance. And to do comparative election law, you need not go further than the United States Supreme Court and compare the five conservative justices with the four what I call moderates, other call them li liberals. So uh, <clears throat> Manoj Mate has this dis uh, fairly distinguished career in, in, in publishing peer review articles and in law journals. And he graduated uh, with his JD at Harvard Law School, go crimson, after getting his PhD in political science and his PhD with highest honors at Berkeley, go Golden Bears. <laughs> and he's also taught at Harvard Berkeley and, uh, as a visiting professor and, and at Whittier Law School, and now at UC Irvine. So he's gracious enough to come back, do this again for the uh, second year in a row. Please give a warm welcome to <laughs> Professor Manoj Mate. Well, thank you, Jonathan, for that uh, wonderful uh, introduction, that gracious introduction. No, no, no. You're Are you not here? Into it. If you use the other one, you can just... Oh, OK. How about now? Is that better? OK, great. Well, I want to thank uh, Jonathan uh, and Concerned Citizens uh, for uh, the invitation again to come back uh, and speak to you all about the Supreme Court review. Um, and it's a real privilege, again, to be speaking to you uh, about the last term of the Supreme Court. Uh, I'm going to focus on a, a small sampling of decisions today and go into greater detail on them. Uh, but I also want to speak more broadly uh, about two themes that I think are important uh, to today's constitutional politics. Uh, the first is I believe we're in a, a moment in American politics that is uh, testing for our constitutional republic. When Benjamin Franklin was leaving the Constitutional Convention, he was asked by someone, what kind of system did you create? And his response was, a republic, if you can keep it. And I think those, that those words resonate today because there's many uh, out there who are concerned about whether or not the republic we created, this constitutional republic, is capable of surviving, uh, given current tensions uh, that the Trump administration uh, is placing on our constitutional system. Uh, and this ranges from issues related to individual rights, separation of powers, equality, federalism, uh, you name it. There are so many different constitutional issues uh, that have been arisen because of many of the Trump administration's policies. Uh, and these, uh, one could argue, pose a threat uh, to constitutional stability uh, in the United States. And I will get into some of those themes uh, as we go through some of the cases. But the second theme I'd like to talk about today has to do with Chief Justice Roberts. So uh, when we teach constitutional law uh, to law students or to undergraduate students, uh, we generally teach constitutional law in time periods, focusing on who the Chief Justice is at a given moment in time. So we talk about the Warren Court. We talk about the Berger Court, the Rehnquist Court, uh, and yes, uh, the Roberts Court. But what's changed uh, between uh, the last couple of years and, and now has to do with the fact that Chief Justice Roberts isn't just the Chief Justice of the United States. He is now also the swing vote on the Supreme Court. And you'll recall, for those of you who attended last year's lecture, I argued, uh, in line with many scholars, that when Justice Anthony Kennedy was replaced by Judge Justice Kavanaugh, uh, basically that left Roberts as the most liberal of the conservative justices on the court. 
Now, everything is relative in politics, and what that means, I'll leave for you to decide. But it basically means that the future of constitutional law on many of these divisive issues is in the hands uh, and the pen of Chief Justice John Roberts. And we're already seeing signs of that in just the past two uh, years. So in the flyer for today's talk uh, that Jonathan had circulated, I pose an interesting question. Uh, is Chief Justice Roberts an institutionalist, or is Chief Justice John Roberts a movement conservative uh, or a conservative ideological judge? Which hat does he wear, or does he wear both of them, or does he balance between both of these? Uh, and I think uh, what we're trying to sort out uh, in, in, within the past year and in the future uh, decisions that are coming up uh, is that Roberts uh, seems to have oscillated between these two poles. So just to give a few examples, uh, Chief Justice Roberts uh, was uh, one of the votes that helped save President Obama's signature legislative initiative, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and there's some who suggest that if you read Roberts' opinion very closely, he switched uh, his vote. Uh, and altered his vote at the last minute to save uh, the law. Uh, this was a different kind of switch in time uh, that saved uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, so there is some evidence out there that suggests that Roberts voted against his conservative uh, ideological mores and instead decided on the basis of preserving the institutional legitimacy of the court uh, to vote to save the Affordable Care Act to not get in the way uh, of the will, if you uh, will, of the legislative majorities that enacted the Affordable Care Act under the leadership of President Barack Obama. A second example of Chief Justice Roberts uh, wearing the institutionalist hat comes from an interesting exchange that the Chief Justice had with President Trump. So recently, President Trump uh, tweeted, uh, and there are too many tweets, obviously, to recount uh, in uh, a short talk today, uh, but he basically attacked a Ninth Circuit judge uh, who had ruled against the Trump administration in an asylum case. And he called out this judge as being an Obama judge. So Trump uh, said the Ninth Circuit was unfriendly to his position, and he, he was, uh, went on record as saying, it's a disgrace, and I'm going to put in a major complaint. This is the President of the United States. <laughs> because you cannot win, if you're us, a case in the Ninth Circuit. Everyone that wants to sue the United States, almost, they file their case in the Ninth Circuit, and it means an automatic loss. This is Trump continuing. No matter what you do, no matter how good your case is, and the Ninth Circuit is really something we have to take a look at because it's not fair. <laughs> this, this is an unprecedented statement, right, from a president of the United States attacking an entire circuit uh, and the fairness of an entire circuit. Uh, but this is not new, right? This is... Uh, the, the transformation that we've seen uh, in Trump uh, and the Republican Party under his uh, leadership. In response, Chief Justice John Roberts, in an unprecedented move, responded to the president and defended the Ninth Circuit judge. He defended the independence of the judiciary uh, after the tr President Trump uh, criticized uh, the judge as an Obama judge. And this is what Chief Justice Roberts said. We do not have Obama judges or Trump judges, Bush judges, or Clinton judges. What we have is an extraordinary group of dedicated judges doing their level best to do equal right to those appearing before them. That independent judiciary is something we should all be thankful for. Uh, and according to the Associated Press, this was the first time Chief, Jeff, Chief Justice Roberts had ever criticized the president uh, at, uh, under his, since he took office. Uh, it doesn't end there, of course. In two tweets later on, uh, Trump wrote, sorry, Chief Justice Roberts, but you do indeed have Obama judges, and they have a much different point of view than the uh, people who are charged with the safety of our country. It would be great if the Ninth Circuit was indeed a, quote, independent judiciary. But if it is, why are so many opposing uh, view on border and safety cases filled there, uh, filed there, and why are a vast number of those cases overturned? Please study the numbers. They are shocking. We need protection and security. These rulings are making our country unsafe, exclamation point. Very dangerous and unwise, exclamation point. <laughs> Again, I, I don't need to tell you that this kind of back and forth between a president and the Chief Justice of the United States on Twitter is absolutely <laughs> unprecedented. But I think it does speak 
to Chief Justice Roberts' institutional fidelity, right, to the institution, to the judiciary. Uh, and I think it is an important moment uh, in the Trump presidency that Chief Justice Roberts uh, did speak up and did stand up for the Ninth Circuit, which is perceived to be the most liberal circuit uh, in the United States. One other example I'll, I'll provide before uh, getting into the case summaries uh, today. Uh, on February 7th, Chief Justice Roberts actually joined the court's liberal justices to stay a Louisiana admitting privileges law that would have likely left uh, the state of Louisiana with one, one practicing abortion doctor. Uh, and now the court uh, is obviously uh, basically weighing uh, this case, June Medical Services versus G. Uh, G. Um, and this uh, follows an earlier vote last year uh, on the part of Roberts who voted not to hear two cases that might have stripped Planned Parenthood uh, of Medicaid funding in certain states. So what has happened? This is the same Chief Justice Roberts who dissented uh, in the earlier Supreme Court decision, Whole Woman's Health versus Hellerstedt, uh, which involved uh, a challenge to a Texas uh, set of laws, a te Texas restrictions, uh, that would have imposed certain restrictions on abortion providers, uh, requiring, for example, equivalent facilities to a surgical center. As a result of Texas's proposed regulations, it would have dramatically uh, curtailed the number of abortion providers and clinics available uh, to women in the state of Texas. Uh, so the majority in that case, including Justice Anthony Kennedy, uh, voted to invalidate the Texas law under the undue burden standard. Chief Justice Roberts dissented. He would have upheld that Texas law. But now he appears to be navigating a slightly different path. What happened? Many observers believe it's because now Roberts is the swing vote instead of Kennedy. Now Roberts is uh, acutely aware that when it comes to these 5-4 votes, it's his vote uh, that's a deciding factor. So he may be thinking not just about institutional legit legitimacy, uh, but how history will perceive him as well moving forward. Okay, so I'd like to briefly now talk about uh, a number of cases that were decided by the court in the last term. Uh, to give you a sense of where I think the court is going and where uh, I think Chief Justice Roberts is going. So the first case that I'm gonna talk about today uh, is, has to do with the census uh, and voting rights. Uh, this relates to President Trump and his administration's efforts to add a question to the census uh, related to citizenship. Uh, second, I'm going to discuss the partisan gerrymandering case uh, that Jonathan uh, just alluded to, uh, Rucho versus Common Cause, which arguably could be one of the most important, if not the most important, politically consequential decisions that the court decided this last term. Third, I'm going to discuss the, fran uh, the case of Franchise Tax Board versus Hyatt, which is a federalism decision, but more importantly is a stare decisis decision having to do with how the court applies and analyzes earlier doctrine and precedent. And finally, I'm going to briefly discuss uh, individual rights uh, and the future of individual rights by focusing on two areas, abortion and LGBTQ rights. Uh, because we've seen the Trump administration now make moves uh, regarding transgender rights uh, and uh, gay and lesbian rights uh, in just the past few years, including uh, for the first time ever a uh, presidential uh, promulgation of a ban on transgender uh, individuals in uh, the military as well, which in a remarkable decision, the United States Supreme Court recently stayed uh, two federal district court injunctions that were trying to, were basically blocking uh, the ban on uh, transgender in the military, uh, and the court has basically now allowed that to go into effect. That, I believe, is an extremely important decision and indeed could be a signal uh, as both Erwin Chemerinsky and Michelle Goodwin have uh, uh, written in a recent article of where the court might go on uh, transgender rights. So let's start by uh, looking at the census case. So how many of you uh, heard or read about uh, the census case? Great, so great show of hands. So obviously this uh, uh, well obviously is a very knowledgeable uh, audience uh, and also uh, this speaks to how important uh, this census case was. So what uh, was at stake in Department of Commerce versus New York, uh, this decision uh, of the US Supreme Court in which Chief Justice Roberts uh, was uh, in uh, the majority. So basically an issue here was the Trump administration's decision to add a citizenship question to the census, to the 2020 census. Now, why were they adding 
this question, we, you may ask. Uh, so in the legal proceedings uh, uh, and uh, during the pendency of this case, uh, Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross advanced uh, a sort of ever-changing explanation for why this was being added. Uh, but one of the main reasons that was advanced was it had to do with the enforcement of the Voting Rights Act. The argument that was being advanced by the Trump administration, uh, which actually hasn't really been doing much when it comes to protecting the Voting Rights Act uh, or prosecuting violations of the Voting Rights Act, was that uh, this particular uh, addition to the census uh, would help the Trump administration when it came uh, to enforcing Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, particularly to protect uh, uh, Hispanic Americans uh, in the United States. This uh, later proved to be untrue. Uh, beca because uh, if you actually uh, looked at, uh, when the court finally looked at new, uh, newly discovered evidence about what had happened, uh, uh, Wilbur Ross, the Secretary of Commerce, had actually gone to the Department of Justice and asked them uh, whether or not this would be essential for uh, vote the voting right for protecting voting rights and the Department of Justice actually uh, wasn't really pushing uh, this issue uh, it was Wilbur Ross trying to get the Department of Justice to say this would help with protecting uh, voting rights uh, and in the decision ultimately although the Supreme Court uh, did hold that the Department of Commerce could add a question uh, and that this question wouldn't violate uh, the enumeration clause or the Census uh, Act uh, the problem here had to do with the rationale for why this was being added. Uh, and ultimately, the majority of the court held uh, that the district court, uh, in this case, was warranted in remanding the case back to uh, the agency, back to uh, the Department of Commerce, uh, because the evidence as presented did not match Secretary Ross's explanation for why he was adding uh, this question. So Roberts basically agreed then uh, that the actual reason offered by Secretary Ross was merely a pretext. What was the real reason for adding that uh, question? Uh, and that there's recently discovered uh, evidence that shows that the Trump administration was trying to add this question to depress uh, Latino representation in this country and to increase uh, the power uh, of white, uh, of white uh, voters in this country vis-a-vis -vis, uh, minority voters. And in fact, uh, there is a uh, formal paper, uh, and the Trump administration did not reveal this early on in the litigation, uh, that explicitly says this was the goal of adding uh, the question. So Ross had pushed for uh, the question and then basically had his agency maneuver uh, against the Department of Justice uh, to basically have them try to falsely provide information stating that this would help them prosecute uh, voting rights claims to help Latino voters, uh, when in fact the Trump Department of Justice has never uh, pursued any single, ca uh, single cases like this. Uh, and again, given uh, this pretext, Robert said it was right for uh, the district court to remand this back as well. So again, I think this is an uh, example of Roberts as an institutionalist, right? Although uh, Roberts was reluctant early on in uh, the case uh, when it came to uh, second-guessing uh, the Secretary of Commerce, as soon as this new evidence came up, Roberts realized the political implications uh, of this decision. Uh, and again, if you actually read Roberts' opinion and Breyer's opinion, there are some who suggest that they even switched their vote uh, in this case as well. Uh, Roberts to a majority, Breyer uh, to a concurring uh, opinion as well. Okay, so now I'd like to turn to uh, a second uh, decision, and this is arguably, I think, one of the most important decisions decided in this past term. This is the case of Rucho versus League of Women Voters, which uh, Jonathan had alluded to. Uh, and in this case, the court, uh, along with a parallel companion case, uh, the Benisek uh, decision, uh, was adjudicating a challenge to partisan gerrymandering in two different states, the states of North Carolina uh, and the state of Maryland. North Carolina involved a Republican gerrymander. Maryland involved a Democratic gerrymander. So voters and plaintiffs in both of these states had brought uh, suits challenging uh, each of these states' congressional districting maps as unconstitutional partisan uh, gerrymanders. 
And if you look at the original filings here, there are a number of bases for these claims, including violations of the First Amendment, violations of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, the Elections Clause, and Article I, Section 2 of the United States Constitution. So the district courts in both of these cases did rule in favor of the plaintiffs, uh, and the defendants appealed directly uh, to the Supreme Court. And ultimately, uh, this is a situation where we see the switchover from Kennedy to Roberts having significant consequence in this case, because uh, the majority in this case held, uh, with Roberts uh, authoring the opinion, that partisan gerrymandering cases present uh, what are basically non-justiciable political questions that the court cannot decide. So let me take a step back and just provide a brief background on what uh, that entails. So under the uh, US Constitution, we have something called the case and controversy requirement. Uh, in order for the US Supreme Court to hear a Supreme Court decision, uh, it must be presented with a live case or controversy. Uh, and out of this uh, requirement, the Supreme Court uh, has basically created a number of justiciability doctrines to basically decide whether or not the court can decide a particular issue before it. And there are a number of justiciability doctrines, including standing uh, doctrine, whether or not an individual uh, has standing uh, to actually bring suit, uh, as well as the political question doctrine. And the political question doctrine uh, is basically a creation of judge-made law. Judges have actually created uh, this political question doctrine. But the basic idea here uh, is that judges and courts do not want to intrude on the province of the elected political branches. They don't want to decide cases uh, that the Constitution allocates authority to the elected political branches to decide. So under the political question doctrine, the Supreme Court has articulated a number of factors for determining whether or not a case is a political question. And I'm gonna focus on two that the court focused on in Rucho. The first factor is whether or not uh, there is a textual commitment to a coordinate political branch, to one of the other elected branches, other than the Supreme Court, other than the judiciary. In this case, president, the president, or Congress. Uh, is there a textual commitment? And second, are there judicially uh, discoverable or manageable standards that could guide the court in its decision making? Are there some earlier doctrinal tests or frameworks that can guide the court uh, in cabining its uh, decision making uh, based on some set of well-established principles here. Now, if you read Justice Kagan's dissent, uh, she says there were uh, such standards here. Uh, and indeed, uh, one of the things that Justice Kennedy had forced many uh, lawyers bringing these challenges to do was to keep refining the standard for det determining whether or not something uh, constituted a partisan gerrymander. Uh, and so as a result, uh, lawyers came up with ingenious tests and frameworks to articulate whether or not something rose to the level of a partisan gerrymander, so much so that Justice Kagan said, uh, we did have a framework, we did have a test here uh, to apply. But Chief Justice Roberts ultimately ruled uh, that these are political questions. Uh, these are questions that the courts should not decide and should be left to uh, the elected branches. And this, uh, I suggest, has and will have seismic political consequences for the future of this country. So why is that? Part of the reason is that over the past 10 to 20 years, the reason Republicans have been so successful at the state legislative level, but also at the US congressional level, is because they've become really, really savvy at engaging in partisan gerrymandering, right? They've made it. Uh, and art, right? They've actually focused on this quite a bit. Uh, and if you look at the evidence and data, for example, in North Carolina, uh, there are actually, according to some of the data, there were actually more Democrats than Republicans in the state of North Carolina. In other words, there are enough Democrats in the state of North Carolina to elect a Democratic legislature, uh, as well as a Democratic congressional delegation. But as uh, Jonathan pointed out, uh, Representative Lewis and others uh, basically wanted to make sure that they magnified the Republican advantage. And as a result, what we're left with is an extraordinary distortion of the American political process. If you look at some of the past midterm elections before the 2018 election where the Democrats finally, finally took back uh, the House of Representatives, you'll see 
that more people were voting for Democrats than Republicans in House elections. And yet, Republicans were maintaining control of the House. How? How is this possible in a system that purports to be a democracy? Partisan gerrymandering. Partisan gerrymandering. It's what enables a state legislature to maximize and distort uh, the actual uh, state of the political electorate uh, by uh, packing voters, by cracking voters, right, by uh, moving voters around in such a way uh, to basically increase their electoral advantage. And both parties do this, right? Democrats obviously uh, were doing this in Maryland. In fact, uh, Steny Hoyer prides himself uh, on uh, his ability uh, to be a, a pioneer of gerrymandering as well. The difference is Republicans have been uh, much better at it, uh, and because they've been winning elections, have been, been uh, able to perpetuate uh, the advantages uh, they've had. But again, I think this speaks to a broader issue that has to do with broader electoral distortions in this country. Who won the 2016 election? Who won the popular vote? <laughs> Secretary Hillary Clinton. Right? Who won the popular vote in the 2000 election? Al Gore. Neither of them became president. Why? Because of something called the Electoral College. Right? The Electoral College uh, also is arguably another form uh, of distortion where the popular vote is not allowed to express itself. Uh, and I believe if these uh, mechanisms are not corrected and reformed soon, uh, there will be sig uh, significant unrest uh, and an upswell. There's already a Supreme Court decision, uh, a Supreme Court case uh, dealing with faithless electors uh, that might be coming up soon. Uh, and if we look at the faithless elector case and uh, potential future cases uh, that involve challenges to uh, the popular compact proposals, which is basically a proposal in which states are able to allocate uh, their electoral votes ba uh, based on the winner of the entire national popular vote. If the Supreme Court gets in the way of that, uh, that could also be a major uh, seismic uh, political event uh, for the court. So. In Rucha versus Common Cause, then, uh, the court says that we're going to stay out of partisan gerrymandering, that this is a political uh, question. And in his opinion, uh, the five, for the five-judge majority, uh, Roberts reassured all of us and said, don't worry, right? there are other channels to challenge partisan gerrymandering. And we just saw this today right, with the North Carolina Supreme Court itself uh, ruling uh, that North, Car North Carolina's gerrymander was indeed uh, a partisan gerrymander. Uh, so you can have state constitutional challenges separate from the federal constitutional challenges. Although given that in many of these states, uh, judges are appointed or closely tied to the majority party, we can't necessarily count on the robustness of state constitutional challenges. Uh, we can also have other forms of reform. Uh, Jonathan mentioned independent redistricting commissions as well. Right? So this can be uh, addressed from the state legislative level. And third and finally, uh, Roberts noted that Congress can address the partisan gerrymandering issue. Right? Uh, how likely is that? <laughs> right? If uh, under a Republican Congress right, that's basically able to hold power, uh, are they that likely to address this? Probably not. Now the question is, Democrats, uh, if Democrats can win both houses, perhaps we might see a move if, it, we, if it's perceived to benefit them uh, politically. Right? But the idea that the states and Congress will magically uh, deal and address with partisan gerrymandering, uh, I think is wishful thinking. It may happen in certain states, but it, it's putting a lot of faith uh, in social movements and electorates. Now, uh, I have some faith because I just heard Jonathan speak about the need to address this issue. And I do know there are reformers on the ground that will be pushing for this. Uh, and I'm hopeful that that will be part of this, the response to the Rucho uh, decision. Uh, but again, uh, effectively what the court has done uh, has basically uh, gone back to an earlier era that precedes the Baker versus Carr decision, uh, which was one of the first decisions where the court said the Supreme Court and federal courts can intervene and review redistricting, uh, basically to a new era where courts are going to stay uh, out of it. Now, one other interesting twist I'd like to point out with the North Carolina Supreme Court decision. If state Supreme Courts do start striking down many of these as partisan gerrymandering, it is possible that the Roberts Court may do an about face on its political question doctrine uh, approach here. Uh, if they perceive that state courts will basically 
be blocking uh, Republican gerrymandering. If Roberts were to do something like that, he'd be taking off his institutionalist hat and putting back on uh, the movement conservative uh, hat. But it's something to watch out for. Okay, real briefly, I wanted to discuss uh, a federalism case that was decided recently. This is the case of Franchise Tax Board uh, versus Hyatt. Uh, and in Franchise Tax Board versus Hyatt, uh, the US Supreme Court did something that it normally doesn't usually do. Uh, it overturned an earlier precedent, uh, Nevada versus Hall, uh, and basically ruled that US states are immune from lawsuits in the courts of other states. Uh, this was an opinion by Justice Clarence Thomas, delivering the opinion for a five-judge majority, uh, which uh, Roberts also uh, joined. Uh, and basically, what we see here is a shift from Nevada versus Hall, this earlier precedent, uh, which had suggested that state immunity was really a function of comedy, whether or not other states uh, were willing to recognize uh, some level of immunity on the part of states. And now what the court has done in overturning Nevada versus Hall uh, in uh, Franchise Tax Board versus Hyatt has basically said the Constitution mandates some form of state sovereign immunity uh, from suits in the courts of other states. What was remarkable about Justice Thomas's opinion in this decision in overturning this old precedent from 1979 was that he said that the Hall decision misread the historical record and misapprehended the constitutional design created by the framers. Furthermore, uh, Justice Thomas wrote uh, that state sovereign immunity from lawsuits was integral to the structure of the Constitution. And in one of the most important parts of the opinion, uh, Thomas wrote uh, that the principle of stare decisis, which is Latin for let the decision stand, let the precedent uh, stand, uh, that the principle of stare decisis is at its weakest when interpreting the Constitution. When interpreting the Constitution. Now, Franchise Tax Board was uh, an arcane case that had to do uh, with tax evasion. Uh, California's Franchise Tax Board was actually trying to go after an individual who had moved to Nevada uh, and they believe was trying to evade uh, his tax burden in the state of California. But What's important about the discussion of stare decisis in uh, Franchise Tax Board versus Hyatt is that according to Justice Thomas, the rules that we look at in terms of deciding whether or not a decision should stand, a precedent should stay in force, seem to be viewed slightly differently from the perspective of the Thomas majority than the Kennedy majority in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, where Justice Kennedy uh, basically wrote uh, that Roe v. Wade uh, was solid precedent, right, that could not be uh, overturned unless there were significant factors militating in favor of that. Uh, and according to the majority here, uh, it seems that the tone has changed. Uh, and the factor, if you look at the factors that were analyzed in this decision, uh, it seems as though the court may be setting us up for a future decision that it, where it can overturn longstanding precedent. So many observers of this case are less concerned about tax evasion from California to Nevada and more concerned about what it means for Roe versus Wade. And if you look at many of Chief Justice Roberts' decisions, uh, there's always a hint, uh, Roberts and others in the majority, of something to come. Right? So the Roberts majorities that we've often seen will often chip away uh, at a, do a, a doctrinal uh, precedent. Uh, for example, we've seen this in Shelby County versus Holder, uh, the case that basically gutted uh, Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act and gutted the preclearance requirement, the federal preclearance requirement uh, under Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Earlier decisions uh, signaled the court's gradual chipping away of earlier precedent uh, in this arena. This isn't an abortion case, but it may be setting up uh, a precedential framework under which uh, the court may be prepared to revisit Roe v. Wade and potentially reverse uh, Roe versus Wade. Now, I'm not going to make a prediction on if or when uh, that is going to happen. Uh, if Roberts is an institutionalist uh, and is concerned about the 2020 election and making sure that the president uh, who's aligned with his politics gets reelected, uh, an opinion overturning Roe versus Wade isn't going to help President Trump get reelected. Uh, but uh, beyond that election, who knows, right? It's, it's, uh, 
hard to see. And if President Trump is reelected and does get to appoint a sixth judge or a seventh judge or more, uh, the chances are uh, that Roe v. Wade will be chipped away significantly, if not entirely overturned at some point. This has been uh, the goal of movement conservatives, of the Federalist Society, and indeed Trump's entire presidency. One reason I think Trump did so well in the 2016 election, and many people haven't spent a lot of time discussing this, is because his staunch position when it came to abortion. And if you look at the polling data, many of the voters who voted for Trump said they voted on one issue, abortion. So uh, this is something to keep our eye out for. So the Hyatt decision, while uh, it seems to be about an arcane issue dealing with state sovereign immunity, its discussion of stare decisis uh, could have important consequences uh, for abortion. And more generally, I think the Hyatt decision, along with earlier federalism decisions, such as Shelby County versus Holder, now shows us where the Roberts Court uh, is going in terms of its federalism jurisprudence. This is federalism on steroids, for lack of a better word. Strong state rights, a strong conception of state sovereignty uh, under the Roberts uh, Court. So I'd like to then use the Hyatt case to uh, transition finally to a discussion of some of the individual rights cases. And I already mentioned abortion. There are several cases that potentially could be coming up in the next term that could potentially be the vehicle for overturning uh, Roe v. Wade. Uh, and I just wanted to give a few examples of states uh, that have been passing laws restricting abortion. Alabama uh, is one of these states. On May 15th, uh, the governor of Alabama uh, signed into law a bill that was so restrictive when it came to abortion, even Republicans in the state were divided over it. A near full ban on, uh, on the procedure with no exceptions for rape or incest. Zero exceptions for rape or incest. It would also make performing abortions a felony in most instances. This is the state uh, of Alabama. Uh, Georgia uh, has, imposed, has basically imposed a six-week uh, abortion ban, which contains very few uh, narrow exceptions. Uh, Kentucky uh, became one of the first states uh, of the year to sign into law its six-week uh, abortion ban. Uh, Louisiana uh, signed a law, uh, the governor signed a law uh, on May 30th banning nearly all abortions, including in cases of rape uh, or incest. Uh, Mississippi, uh, on and on, right? We, we're seeing states uh, enacting more and more restrictive measures. And some of these states have not hidden uh, their goal. Their goal is for one of these laws to be challenged in the Supreme Court and for the court to revisit Roe v. Wade and potentially overturn Roe v. Wade and uphold potentially outright bans on uh, abortion. So I said last year I, I warned about abortion. Uh, I am much more worried uh, this year than I was uh, last year. I was worried actually last year as well. Uh, but you, as you're starting to see these things uh, march on, uh, it speaks to the importance of the next presidential uh, election. If, if you do care about a woman, if you believe that women have a right to privacy and a right to reproductive rights, uh, you would probably uh, want uh, a change uh, in 2020. Uh, <laughs> but uh, if you, uh, like many uh, in this country, believe that it should be criminalized, that doctors should be criminalized, uh, potentially thrown in jail, uh, that women should not be allowed to uh, have abortions, uh, which would probably push us back to an era where women are forced to get abortions in other unsafe ways, often endangering their own lives, uh, then you'd probably be happy with the direction of the court and the direction of the country. I know I may have not framed that in the most neutral uh, of terms here, but uh, that's the way I uh, see it. Again, I do understand there are important moral uh, concerns that animate uh, why individuals are opposed uh, to abortion. Uh, but I do think the constitutional issue and constitutional analysis ideally should be hopefully divorced, uh, at least in some degree, uh, from pure uh, morality. Uh, okay, so abortion is something to keep our eye out on. But LGBTQ rights, I think, is this next generation issue under the Trump administration that we should also be focused on. I mentioned President Trump's uh, ban on transgender in the military. But the president uh, and his administration have also been now 
pushing to restrict the rights uh, of gay and lesbian individuals when it comes to employment discrimination. Uh, and if you look at, uh, there are actually a number of cases uh, that will be coming up in the next term that squarely deal with statutory interpretation issues uh, uh, under Title VII uh, as to whether or not uh, this should be recognized, whether or not sexual orientation and indeed transgender identity uh, should be recognized as protected uh, identity, as protected suspect classes, or whether or not it shouldn't, uh, whether it should not uh, merit protection under existing uh, federal statutes. The Trump administration, again, is, has been pushing hard on both transgender uh, and uh, restricting the scope of employment discrimination. So I think this speaks to one other point, which is uh, there was a lot of celebration over the Windsor and Obergefell decisions, right? The US Supreme Court finally recognized same-sex marriage rights, marriage equality, uh, and that was an important day. Uh, but what we're seeing now is the limits of that Obergefell decision, indeed, a decision that Justice Kennedy was a part of. Uh, because of the way the court structured its decision based on substantive due process and a very restricted conception of equality based on traditional conceptions of family, based on traditional conceptions of marriage, there's not a lot in Obergefell to support uh, an expanded conception of LGBTQ rights and equality in the employment context. Indeed, there is no precedent right now that would provide that foundation. And my worry going forward is one of these decisions may actually rule uh, against uh, equality and rights, particularly in the employment context, uh, and open up a new era of discrimination uh, that's sanctioned by the government. Again, the Trump administration, if you look at how it proceeded with its ban on transgender in the military, uh, it mirrors in some ways the Trump versus Hawaii case, the case involving the Muslim ban. Right. Trump leads with a series of tweets right, where he wants to uh, push some discriminatory policy right, that he campaigned on in the last election that his voters, his electoral base cares about, uh, and then gives it to his executive agencies and says, find a way to sanitize the policy, to make it survive constitutional scrutiny. And in much the same way that the travel ban had to go through multiple iterations to finally survive Supreme Court scrutiny, uh, we've seen the uh, Defense Department do the same thing with Trump's initial call for a transgender uh, ban. Uh, indeed, offering what seem to be pretextual sources of evidence suggesting uh, that the transgender ban would be good for the military, when in fact, if we look at many other countries that do allow transgender individuals to serve uh, in the military, uh, the empirical evidence is not really there, right? That suggests that it uh, would endanger or harm the military uh, or prevent it from serving uh, its mission. But again, I think this is an issue that Trump's base cares about. Just like they care about abortion, uh, they care uh, about the moral implications of LGBTQ rights, uh, and we're seeing it uh, not just from the administration, but potentially now we might see a court decision that could restrict the scope uh, of these rights. There were a number of other decisions uh, decided, and I, I realize I'm well over time, so I'll uh, hold off on those, and uh, I'm happy to discuss those in the questions and answers. But uh, thank you again, and I look forward uh, to a robust discussion. So the, the question uh, the question is oh, oops, sorry. so the question is uh, why doesn't the equal protection clause apply uh, in the gerrymandering context and well th this is there are is a doctrinal uh, split right in terms of whether judges believe uh, you can bring uh, equal protection challenges on the basis of different forms of gerrymandering part of this has to do with the different types of theories and tests that lawyers were trying to create to appeal to uh, Justice Kennedy when he was the swing uh, vote. Uh, and some of the uh, tests that were being developed were largely based on the First Amendment, uh, dealing with uh, voting in terms of the expressive component uh, of voting. 
uh, as a form of expression. Uh, you know, when we talk about equal protection and equality, we're usually talking about uh, whether or not there's a suspect classification and a group, uh, a minority group, right, that's being harmed. So while equal protection works for uh, racial gerrymandering cases, it's a more difficult claim to make when you're talking about partisan identification because we're simply talking about Democratic or Republican uh, voters. At the same time, however, I do think you could construct an argument based on the equal protection clause, uh, but it would not have, the, it would not have support uh, among a five-judge majority on the court right now, and it would require you to adopt a little bit more of an expansive conception of equality uh, related to the right to participate in democracy. Uh, and again, that's sort of a theory that's out there that uh, you know, hasn't really found much mainstream support, at least on recent uh, benches. What's going to happen um, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg dies, if she dies before? So the, the, question, uh, the question is, uh, what's going to happen uh, when uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, God forbid, uh, passes away or retires um, before the end of this cycle. So, uh, and again, it's something I, you know, I, I, I don't want to even anticipate or uh, think about uh, uh, something of that nature, but I, I do think it speaks to the fragility uh, of how close these 5-4 majorities are, uh, that one judge makes a significant difference uh, on the court. Uh, if a, one of the liberal justices uh, retires or, God forbid, uh, passes away before the 2020 election, uh, the president would appoint, uh, I, I have no doubt in my mind, unlike uh, what we saw under uh, you know, President Obama. President Obama did not force as, uh, you know, as strenuously as he could have the Merrick Garland appointment. He could have done a recess appointment. He could have tried something to push it through. It might have been challenged here. Uh, I believe the president will push through an appointment as quickly as possible, and I believe uh, Mitch McConnell in the Senate will make, uh, make sure it can happen. Uh, it could have political consequences, of course. Right? It could be a high-risk maneuver, maneuver. There could be backlash. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so I think if we do see uh, a retirement, unless McConnell and Trump are so timid about the potential electoral backlash, I believe they'll try to push uh, to replace. And if that happens... Uh, the 2020 election uh, won't matter in terms of that sixth vote because it will have already happened. All that will change is you know, the much longer term. And again, I think this is an argument for why we need term limits on the U.S. Supreme Court or some type of different system on the U.S. Supreme Court. Right? Because, and not to take anything away from uh, the extraordinary career of Justice Ginsburg or Breyer or Kagan or Sotomayor uh, or any of the other justices that have served on the court, uh, but I think we're now living in an era because we have such an intensely partisan divide in our country and there's such intensely partisan battles as we saw in the Merrick Garland uh, decision. So much of the future of our country is basically based on the vagaries of presidential elections, who gets appointed, and how long justices are able to stay on the court. Other countries have retirement ages, mandatory capped ret retirement ages. Uh, other uh, systems, again, have... Uh, term limits. And I think uh, at this point, uh, it would be better for our democracy uh, to have uh, that type of system. Uh, because again, we're going to get to a point where uh, those who are represented on the court do not represent uh, massive shifts that are taking place uh, in the country. Hey, uh, in view of all the mass shootings that have been going on, can you envision any scenario where we will have some kind of action that will possibly come up to the Supreme Court regarding the Second So the question is, in light of uh, many of the mass shootings uh, from El Paso to uh, uh, Dayton uh, to Gilroy, uh, are we likely to see uh, any shifts uh, on, the, on the court when it comes to the Second Amendment? Uh, and I'd like to, if I may, also add, are we likely to see any uh, shifts in, in Congress? Right? Are we likely to see any developments there? Um, with respect to the court, uh, given the Supreme Court's decisions in the McDonald decision and the Heller case, where the, the court basically reinterpreted the Second Amendment uh, as being an individual right to bear arms as opposed to a collective right tied to state militias, uh, I believe uh, Chief Justice Roberts is firmly in line with uh, the conservative movement, uh, and we wouldn't likely see uh, a reversal uh, from Heller uh, 
Now, at the same time, it is possible that if Congress uh, and or the states do enact uh, some hopefully new measures when it comes to restricting guns, and it, you know, we, we keep seeing this every week in our news, right? The, the numbers, uh, and, and, we, and we don't see much political action uh, on the part of Congress. If Congress did pass uh, you know, new legislation uh, and it was challenged, I think that's a slightly different question. I, th I think you could see the court and potentially Roberts as institutionalists finding a way to try to uphold a decision uh, without necessarily uh, questioning the Heller case. So I think the institutionalist Roberts in much the same way that he, he did in the Affordable Care Act, if under, if President Trump and Mitch McConnell uh, get out there and say, we're going to do something about guns and take on uh, the NRA. Um, uh, it, yeah, it, yeah. It, wishful thinking, perhaps. Uh, but if, if you did see that, I think you might see uh, a Roberts uh, in a court challenge find a way to try to uphold uh, a gun control measure. But I am unfortunately not optimistic about it. Mitch McConnell has had a lot of time right now. He could have brought Congress back into session and, and rushed uh, something. We've seen nothing. Uh, and it's, it's, again, it's, it's shocking to see everyday children, women and children in, in schools, uh, vulnerable populations who are, have no defense, right? You're in a shopping center. You're in a shopping mall. Uh, we're seeing now some of these recent attacks uh, openly being promulgated by those who are advancing an agenda of white supremacy. That individual who drove to El Paso to massacre uh, Latinos uh, and others in El Paso drove to El Paso with that specific intent to do so. And we've seen this in other contexts as well. So I think this is a national emergency in this country and we need to see some political action on it. Uh, and, and even if you do believe in the Second Amendment and the right to bear arms, if you poll uh, NRA members, uh, you'll even see many of them support background checks and many other common sense measures. So I think there is, there is a consensus for this. I hope our politicians start listening uh, soon. On the question of discrimination on the basis of religion or sexual preference, can a person defend themselves by simply refusing to say what their religion or their sexual preference is? Can any court or official or even a congressional committee force you to tell? Yeah, so the, the question is, uh, when it comes to different forms of discrimination on the basis of religion uh, or sexual orientation or other classifications, can you be forced uh, to basically uh, self-identify? Uh, now, uh, based on uh, constitutional protections, uh, you, the state cannot force or compel uh, an individual uh, necessarily to basically disclose what their religion is, what their sexual orientation is. Uh, we know actually the don't ask, don't tell policy right under President Clinton uh, specifically tried to basically take advantage of a compromise approach, uh, which wasn't entirely su successful, uh, of, that allowed individuals to not have to uh, identify. Uh, and it, but let me make a caveat to this point. Uh, part of the compromise uh, of the Mattis report with regard to the transgender military ban uh, has to do uh, with whether or not one has to undergo a medical examination. Because effectively, the, the Trump ban on transgender uh, is treating transgender uh, as a medical illness, as a pathology, right? Uh, and so, uh, you know, basically, it, uh, on the, first of all, it creates a stigma and a deterrence for anyone to want to uh, self-identify. Uh, but, but second, uh, I think it also approaches the problem instead of from a rights and equality standpoint, uh, from a very oppressive medical uh, standpoint, based on outdated conceptions uh, of, uh, of psychological uh, frameworks and evaluation that, we, uh, that have been discredited. So I, I think part of the issue is while technically the state cannot compel you uh, to, to self-identify, uh, I think the broader concern is whether or not uh, the state is preventing people from being able to express themselves and their identity and serve in government and serve in the military and work in any em employment uh, context. Uh, and so when it comes to, for example, protections uh, in the employment context, even though the state may not necessarily be able to force you uh, to self-identify what your orientation is, uh, if someone is perceived by an employer uh, to be 
uh, of a particular religion or of a particular orienta sexual orientation, uh, and they're discriminated on that basis, in order to sue, uh, the individual would, would at some point basically have to self-identify. So in some ways, I think that gets to the, the broader concern here, which is the minute you impose these policies or rule that s statutes or constitutional provisions do not provide protections, you're inevitably going to force individuals, if, if they want to, uh, protect themselves and protect their constitutional rights to have to uh, identify. I'm not sure I'm completely answering your question. So, um, in my opinion, one of the worst decisions of the Supreme Court was the Citizens United case. I think that's the name of it that allowed unlimited amounts of money to get into politics. I'm just curious if there's anything in the pipeline attempting to modify that or, or change that or, or, or turn it around. Cause that, Again, I think that was a disaster. So the question is, uh, is there anything in the pipeline to uh, modify or address the Citizens uh, United uh, decision? Uh, and obviously, again, under uh, Chief Justice Roberts and the Roberts Court, we've seen in Citizens United and indeed the McCutcheon uh, decision, the court basically supervising over the deregulation of campaign finance as we know it uh, in the United States, allowing for uh, corporate spending, uh, allowing for independent expenditures, allowing for uh, no, basically eliminating the caps on aggregate contributions made by individuals. Uh, all of this has taken place in the, in the past couple of years here. There are, I should mention, there are proposals in Congress right now among the Democrats uh, to directly respond to this, uh, both in the form of legislation as well as a proposed constitutional amendment. Uh, I believe the legislation would have a, a, a stronger chance of passing than the amendment uh, to basically overturn uh, Citizens United. But this would require electing a new, a president of a different political party, uh, winning back the Senate, uh, and making sure that the Senate majority and the House majorities are strong enough uh, to potentially push through an amendment uh, if possible. Uh, we've actually seen a large number of Republicans retiring uh, in the House uh, and now in the Senate as well. So uh, that, uh, that potentially augurs well uh, for uh, tr the Democrats trying to take back both houses. So there are legislative, but in terms of the Supreme Court, uh, again, unless we see a, a new president and new, ju uh, new justices appointed to the court that restores a different 5-4 balance, I don't see Citizens United getting overturned uh, in the near future. But I do agree with you. It has been, uh, had a, a tremendous impact on our political system. If, and I say this with a big if, is there any way that the court can be changed? I believe one of the candidates, and there's so many, I don't remember which one it was, running for president, said that they could have a Supreme Court justice move to another bench. Are there any ways to fix the problem? Yes, yeah, so th there are a number of other proposals other than uh, the, t the term limit proposal. Some, some have called for adding new justices, to, to basically enlarging the court for every uh, uh, you know, judge on the court, adding a certain number of justices until you get to uh, a majority that uh, is more balanced uh, potentially. Uh, you know, we can think about FDR's court packing schemes uh, from the New Deal era as well. Uh, so I, I, I am aware that uh, certain candidates have been pushing for, for different forms of reform. I, I think these are, again, unlikely uh, to pass uh, unless you have a Democratic president and strong legislative majorities. You know, even FDR with his court packing plan faced tremendous political backlash. Uh, he ultimately did get to a point, uh, you know, all, the entire court uh, and, and uh, due to retirement. Uh, so these are, I think these, some of these uh, proposals are uh, politically challenging and could uh, provoke some backlash. But again, I think if we keep seeing the types of maneuvering that we saw, for example, from Senator McConnell with regard to uh, Merrick Garland's appointment, uh, then you know, I believe uh, Pete Buttigieg uh, has uh, advanced a proposal similar to the one you've mentioned, which is basically trying to correct uh, the wrong, according to Pete Buttigieg, that was done by McConnell. Uh, if the Senate is failing to perform its function, uh, should we have some reforms that address this? The only problem, of course, with these kind of proposals is we'll constantly see political maneuvering uh, in, in alignment with elections here. So I do think term limits would be a long-term solution uh, to the problem. Well, thanks so much.
excellent presentation. There is no doubt about it. But my my question is, how is it uh, possible at all? And if yes, uh, then would you please suggest, uh, you know, how the concentration can be, what is good for the country instead of how we can get Republicans elected or Democrats elected? Now, in your place, if we had another person who is a, a pro-life conservative Republican speaking, uh, you know, it would, uh, what you said would be exactly opposite. You know that. So, so thank you. Well, th thank you for, uh, for the question. Uh, you know, so I, I want to speak to uh, partisan gerrymandering as a as a neutral uh, concern, right? Because uh, the issue is, if if Democrats were doing the same thing right now and distorting elections and for and where Republicans controlled majorities, I would be making the exact same argument. And the reason I'd be making that same exact argument uh, is the solution that I think you're calling for uh, is one where we have competitive elections. Right, where we have districts that aren't just packed Democratic or Republican, but true swing districts where Democrats and Republicans both have to campaign on the power of their agendas and ideas to the people and convince the voters as to who is uh, the best candidate and who is the best party. Partisan gerrymandering prevents that from happening. It prevents the rise of these swing districts uh, and districts that allow the parties to be competitive. So I think the solution, uh, independent redistricting commissions is part of the solution. Uh, a reversal of the Rucho decision where the court can police extreme partisan gerrymandering because ultimately we're concerned about distortions of the electoral process. Uh, if uh, the Republicans in North Carolina have an 11 to 3 or 10 to 2 uh, majority, but the actual vote count is 50-50, that makes no sense in a democracy. No, no other country would defend this system. And countries that are defending that system, we would call authoritarian or anti-democratic. But that's happening in our own backyard. So I think the solution here is not a Republican one or a Democratic one. When it comes to partisan gerrymandering, let the voters vote. Let the parties compete for those votes. Partisan gerrymandering basically is a lockup of the system. You're enabling one party through partisan gerrymandering to lock up the vote. If Republicans think they're the better party in North Carolina, don't gerrymander. Compete with Democrats in fair elections and beat them in fair elections. Be beat them in a system where voting rights are not being curtailed, where voter ID laws are not being imposed to prevent African Americans and senior citizens and college students from voting. So again, you know, this is not a Republican or a Democratic issue. This is an issue related to the right to vote. And we simply make it very difficult for people to vote. And the distortions of partisan gerrymandering, I think, make it difficult for the parties to compete. Because if the Republicans don't have to compete in a gerrymandered state, why do they have to bother reaching out to swing voters and Democrats? They know they're going to win. They know they're going to have the majority. Uh, so I think the solution is independent uh, redistricting commissions. Uh, and you, your point about uh, abortion, that someone with a different perspective on abortion would have a different view, I don't think ab the abortion has anything to do with partisan gerrymandering. I think partisan gerrymandering is a, pro is a process question. Right? So if, if you think Republicans can't win in fair elections without gerrymandering, then that says something about the party and the strength of its ideas and whether it represents the people. Uh, and I think that speaks really badly if you don't think you can win and you're not willing to change this. I'll say one last point. If you look at the majority, the vast majority of Republican districts in Congress, look at the demographics of those districts and you'll find that they're 70, 80, 90, 95% white. Very few minority voters in these districts. Democrats, it's flipped. Uh, as you, if you look at Democratic districts, you'll find much larger percentages of minority voters. So one result of gerrymandering is a de facto state of apartheid in our congressional representation. Republicans aren't representing the same uh, electorate as Democrats, and that's why they can't speak to one another. So, I think, uh, as, a, as a lifelong Republican, you would agree with me that Republicans would be better served if they had to compete in more diverse districts that were more representative of the entire country, uh, because tr I think Trump it may just be a short blip on the radar. Uh, as things continue, I don't see Republicans winning if we correct partisan gerrymandering. But this is the only way they can win in certain states and hold on to power. And that's not consistent with our, at least the, the, the principles of democracy that I was taught 
in elementary school, in college. Uh, so yeah, that, I, those would be my solutions. Uh, independent redistricting, but let people vote and let parties compete on a, on a fair process. And right now, it's not, it's not fair. Yeah, so the question is that uh, it is possible uh, with complete control of uh, the Senate and the presidency, uh, Democrats could expand the court, right? There's, there's nothing to stop them uh, for doing it. And it would be an immediate uh, you know, fix in terms of restoring uh, the, the balance. Uh, and again, this may be where we're going, right? We might act, this might become the new norm where we see parties uh, modulating the size of the court uh, to correct this. Uh, it still will perpetuate some of the, the partisanship, right? Because we still have a deeply partisan uh, court, but I, I agree that you would actually have more oscillations uh, in, in jurisprudence on the court. Yeah, and again, I, I, do, I think the fact that the Senate right, uh, is not as representative of, as the House uh, and it, it is able to play a check when it comes to the court does lead to uh, another, another level of distortion when it comes to the court, right? How can one person in Kentucky, one senator from Kentucky, basically control the future of the court, right? But that's basically what uh, has happened here. This is not what the, the constitutional framers envisioned. If you ask Madison, Hamilton, any of these people, they would say this is a distortion uh, of the way the process was supposed uh, to work. So uh, I do agree there, there are reforms that could take place that could correct uh, some of this. What's the best argument that could be made uh, or gerrymandering to be considered unconstitutional? So the, uh, the question is, what is the best argument to be made for why uh, partisan gerrymandering should be considered uh, to be unconstitutional? Uh, again, I think if you look at uh, you know, Kagan's dissent, as well as some of the, uh, the, the arguments that were advanced, uh, part of this has to do with the fact that partisan gerrymandering, one could argue, interferes with the ability of voters under the First Amendment to be able to participate in the political process, and indeed to allow political parties like the Democratic Party to uh, compete and participate fairly. So uh, there is a First Amendment argument that could be made uh, as to why extreme partisan gerrymandering uh, is unconstitutional. Uh, I think there's other bases here, the Elections Clause, Article 1, Section 2, uh, that we could rely on as well, but uh, that may be the strongest argument, some type of uh, participatory right when it comes to voters' ability to participate uh, and politicians' ability to participate. One problem, of course, though, is in the previous uh, term, we had a case called Gill versus Whitford, in which the court basically kicked out this case on standing ground, saying that in order to have standing, a voter would have to prove that they resided in one of the districts that was either packed or cracked. And to prove that uh, is, can be very uh, difficult. So. Uh, that points to some of the difficulty here in making these types of arguments. But uh, we've had some uh, new sort of theoretical approaches advanced by scholars, including one by uh, Nick Stephanopoulos, uh, who's a, a professor at University of Chicago School of Law. Now I believe he's moving to, to Harvard. Uh, he came up with a measure called the efficiency gap, where, where you basically evaluate and analyze uh, what, what, are the, what is the practical impact uh, of uh, the actual partisan gerrymandering uh, and how do we compare this uh, to sort of new, how a neutral system uh, of redistricting would work. But I think the case for uh, unconstitutionality would hinge on the First Amendment and in a more radical uh, measure, uh, an equal protection claim uh, as well based on party. Uh, but again, right now, much easier to prove a racial gerrymander than a partisan gerrymander. Roberts and the majority basically made the argument that politics is supposed to be part of the game, right? Politics is what the, the constitutional framers envision. I think this would be what uh, uh, Asha was uh, arguing as well, that we cannot treat it as a, con a constitutional equivalent to race, for example. But one argument you could make is if minority voters, African-American voters, for example, in North Carolina, vote 90 to 95% or more for the Democratic Party, if you're locking out the Democrats, you're effectively locking out minority representation as well. 
I'm told this will be the last question, so it'll be a juicy one. Okay. <laughs> one thing you talked about, but, uh, about, you talked about talking about, but haven't talked about tonight, is to make, uh, distinguishing between uh, judicial conservatism and an activist conservative a group of judges. So if you were uh, given sodium pentothal and then woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning and asked whether the judges have uh, an agenda that they're pursuing that it may look like, and how do you explain the fact that it's always 5-4 with uh, the appointees of Trump and the two Bushes versus the appointees of Obama and Clinton? Does that just reflect uh, you know, jurisprudential differences, or is that political? Yeah, so, so the question has to do with, again, this uh, idea of the difference between a, what's called a judicial conservative uh, versus uh, an ideological conservative. A judicial conservative refers to uh, a judge who believes in following precedent and existing doctrine, doctrine. Justice David Souter was a classic example of a judge appointed by a Republican who uh, believed in following precedent uh, and often voted with liberals a, as a result. Uh, versus a movement or ideological conservative who primarily votes their own conservative ideology uh, most of the time. Now, th there is a robust field of uh, scholarship on judicial politics that suggests that judges are driven not just by their own attitudes uh, and their views of existing precedent, but also strategic factors, institutional factors, uh, other factors. I would say... Uh, for many of these hot-button controversial issues, abortion and other things, uh, I would predict, in line with the, what's known as the attitudinal model, that conservatives will vote the conservative position and liberals will vote the liberal position. However, if a judge is, believes and perceives themselves to be a swing vote, that is the decisive vote, it might affect their behavior, which is why Justice Kennedy uh, didn't always vote uh, the conservative line, uh, and which is why li liberal swing votes uh, have also behaved uh, in slightly different ways. So in certain instances, uh, a chief justice or a swing justice may be motivated by institutional concerns, reputational concerns, legitimacy uh, concerns, or just a concern about the impact of what their one vote will have uh, because it's all riding uh, on, on them. So uh, you know, again, I, I uh, would hesitate to take uh, uh, truth serum at, uh, to, to answer the question, but uh, I'd say a lot of uh, judging does reflect judicial ideology, but at the same time, I do believe uh, existing legal precedent and frameworks uh, do guide uh, many decisions uh, and are often used by judges, I think, to avoid uh, having to uh, find a different way to justify uh, their decisions. Uh, but I also do think judges act strategically. Uh, sometimes judges, for example, will, will modify their opinion right, to get uh, a certain majority on a court. Right? They will often rewrite their opinions in certain ways. They may be concerned about how the elected branches may respond. These are all other factors here. So uh, to wrap up, I think the, you know, the, the, it's a mix, I believe, of judicial ideology, uh, legal uh, norms, and institutional norms. I think all of these are in the mix, uh, and it particularly depends on the judge and their position within a, a particular majority. We would like to thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.